for this introduction, I found out to my, uh, uh, well, actually excitement actually, uh, in a way, I was pleased that I found out that Ariel has a background in professional social work, which I do also. So I immediately felt a kinship that way. Um, so uh, secondly, I, as, as many, if not all of you know, she has quite a background with uh, Code Pink. And um, she worked with them nearly seven years, particularly regarding uh, the Middle East policy work. And as uh, many of you know, she is uh, quite an activist, an advocate. And um, I, I highly respect that. I have Bear with me, I, my computer isn't working, so I have to go over here and I had this all set up and of course my computer didn't work. So I'm working with my wife Marty's iPad. So I have, I have a couple of quotes here from people who have worked with Ariel. One was uh, Danica, Katowicz, I believe, Code Pink co-director. Quote, Ariel leads with so much courage and inspires us even when we are facing the country's most powerful people. And from uh, Emily, I'm not sure if I pronounce this right, Durrell, social media communications director, I imagine that's the Code Pink, Ariel just isn't just a fiercely dedicated activist who bravely puts her body on the line in the name of peace and justice. She's also a warm, supportive mentor and friend who models compassion and love wherever she goes. I can't top that. <laughs> um, so without any further talk on my part, uh, Ilya, we're just very glad and thankful and honored to have you here today. And let's give uh, Ilya a very warm welcome. Hi, everyone. I'm incredibly thrilled uh, to be here with all of you and honored and thrilled to be leading the Fellowship of Reconciliation in this urgent time, in this urgent time where here in the US, uh, Christian nationalism and white supremacy are growing, in this time where across Europe, we are seeing a rise of a return and a rise of fascism, a time where uh, in the Holy Land, uh, the most far right racist extremist government that Israel has had to date is soon to come into power. And at a time when the war in Ukraine threatens the very existence of life on earth um, and the possibility of nuclear annihilation. So I think this is a really important moment. And given the religious extremism, whether that's Christian nationalism here in the US, or Jewish supremacy in uh, Israel and Palestine, um, I think this is a moment that that FOR was made to address. And so I'm really thrilled to um, and honored uh, to be taking leadership in this time so that we can help be part of um, the change that is so urgently needed. I will talk a little bit about my background and then a little bit about um, the initiatives that uh, FOR National is embarking on that I'm really excited about. And then, um, you know, pretty quickly, I'd like to open it up to questions. I, I find that, um, 
the best talks for me are those that are a conversation rather than a lecture. I think that's uh, much more edifying. So a bit about me, which will kind of lead right into today too, because kind of circles back, is uh, that I grew up in the um, anti-nuclear um, peace movement of the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, my mother, uh, we lived in Gainesville, Florida, my mother and my brother and I. And that's just a little ways from Cape Canaveral, Florida, where there's the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base. And where at that time, and I'm sure still, uh, Trident missiles were being stored. So frequently um, on the weekend when I was a kid, my mom would pack us up into the car and we'd go with some friends of hers who also had kids make it a family trip and uh, head down to Cape Canaveral for protests that were taking place there. And um, I became familiar with the language. We had some like kids songs against war and <laughs> nuclear annihilation, some of which I still remember. We're a little silly, but very educational for, I was around 10 at the time. Um, but we would also, some of the people in the protest would do civil disobedience. They would climb over the fence into the army base. And I remember noting that and asking my mother about um, that the first ones were, were often uh, people of the cloth, identifiably. And I remember asking her why, and she said that uh, that made a real statement and it helped inspire others and that it drew attention to the immorality uh, of war. And so that was my, my upbringing as a child. And uh, I participated in my first act of civil disobedience when I was 16 at the Nevada uh, underground nuclear test site um, where we spent days walking um, across the desert. It was Shoshone Native American land and um, culminating in a couple days of civil disobedience. And I hadn't really intended to participate in the civil disobedience. I was kind of a classic teenager by that time. My mom had brought me and a couple friends, but I just felt the, the swell of um, emotion over the necessity of this uh, moment. And um, when people marched into the to the road and sat down, I, I joined them. And one of the things that really affected me at that time and still does, it reminds me of um, how we are all one human family, even when we're on different sides of the lines, uh, was that the police officer or one of the police officer who arrested us, that we were put on a bus and transported and then released. Uh, thanked us and he said his wife had cancer from the and he knew it was from the nuclear testing and he said you know I have to work today there's not an option for me not to we have to pay for her cancer treatment but he thanked us for being there and that was incredibly affecting to me I'm going to fast forward quite a bit um I had went to school for social work and had a couple of children and um, I used to, I showed up at protests, you know, I, I live in Ithaca, New York, which is Cayuga Nation land. And we are a heavily Catholic worker community, a large, um, there's a large radical activist community here that's heavily involved. And we're close to the, um, one of the drone bases, Hancock Air Force Base, which is one of the places where drones are operated. So for many, many years, um, over a decade, uh, there have been protests and, you know, we take uh, car loads of people and, but I was really just a participant. My kids were young. Um, we would go out and, you know, we would protest and, you know, join with the other people. I wasn't really an organizer in that sense. And then the 2008, uh, 2009 assault on Gaza took place. And I didn't know too much about um, the situation in, in Israel and Palestine. I was raised mostly secular and had started to explore Judaism on my own. And 
sent my kids to the Hebrew school at uh, our synagogue and was kind of at their level, like learning um, the prayers with them. And, uh, but I know I'm always against war. Like that's just a no brainer for me, right? If, if, if there's war and violence and people are being hurt, that, you know, I'm always, and that's terrible, but I didn't have a, a deep understanding of it. And then the bombs started falling in Gaza and it was broadcast through mainstream news. And I saw it and I just started, and I saw it and I just okay. started. Okay. Can I set it over here then? Yeah. I just started sobbing. I think my children were two and four yeah. at that time, or three and five, something like that. And I was a single mom and it was winter. And, uh, but I just couldn't, I couldn't sit with the, the knowledge that my people, my people, we're committing these horrific crimes. We're killing children and committing these horrific, horrific crimes. And uh, so there was a local little protest out by a street corner and I bundled the kids up in their snowsuits and we went out there, I think every day or every, you know, every couple of days while the war was going on and went to, I went to meetings about it. And, um, but then after it ended, I went back to being a mom, <laughs> which, it was very full time being a mom and a grad student at the same time. And um, yeah, I more followed the news. And then uh, the 2000, I think it was 2011 assault on Gaza took place. And my heart sank again. And I said to myself, I never again want to say, want to, want to regret what I was doing in the time in between um, these crimes committed in my name with my family's support over the years um, as uh, my family had long supported the state of Israel and were in fact very early Zionists. So um, I really haven't stopped since then. And uh, it was then that I, I became the coordinator for our local Jewish Voice for Peace chapter. We started doing uh, protests. We had a, um, still have, but we had a uh, Fellowship of Reconciliation chapter here. Um, my dear friend, Jim Mur Murphy, who's also Veterans for Peace. So I started working with FOR then in, you know, because we would uh, collaborate and co-sponsor each other's events. So it was shortly after the, so I was, I finished grad school and I spent a bit of time working for Friends of Seville uh, North America, which is a, for anyone who's not familiar, they're an ecumenical Christian uh, organization in support of Palestinian rights. And I did some campaign development for them, but it was temporary uh, work. And uh, then I saw Code Pink was uh, advertising uh, that they needed somebody to lead a delegation to Palestine. And I reached out and said, and there was a, I think it was a temporary thing again, but I said, you know, I'd love to do that. I um, have been going there since uh, 2013 at that point. I brought my children um, there and uh, to the West Bank and, um, uh, Medea, who's one of the co-founders of Code Pink, uh, the, co the director at that time, uh, Allie McCracken, she went to Medea to, you know, I said, you know, what do you want me to send in terms of a resume? And Medea said, you were arrested with us at APAC last year. And that, that's all I need to see, <laughs> you're on. And uh, that was the beginning of seven, almost seven very, very uh, busy years with Code Pink. And what began as, uh, Palestine campaigning, campaigning for Palestinian rights, uh, broadened to Middle East political analysis, um, US foreign policy analysis, and co-director, and um, doing a lot of work on militarism here in the US. And at that, and then towards the end of my time at Code Pink, the war in Ukraine started. And so we formed uh, the Peace in Ukraine Coalition, 
which I encourage folks to check out and FOR is a member, an active member, and that's peaceinukraine.org. And uh, I started running the coalition. And at the same time, I was ready to move on. I had been with Code Pink for quite a long time and I was looking to uh, work on more than just foreign policy and to bring my faith that especially during the pandemic had really deepened and had become so much a part of me. So I wanted to really bring that into my work. And that was when I, I saw the uh, opening at Fellowship of Reconciliation. So uh, it was for, for me, I thought it was a very quick ap uh, <laughs> application process or interview process. They thought it took quite a while, but it was maybe a month or so before I was hired. And it's really been fantastic. And I have to say one of the best parts of I'm going on going into my fourth month as executive director. And one of the best parts for me is the community, the beloved community, both our staff and team and the National Council and our chapters and just our community and the intentionality and, and deep commitment to nonviolence and pacifism. I, uh, I think back frequently to um, this Palestinian friend of mine, activist, and he, well, first of all, I'll uh, backtrack a little bit. Until 2018, I used to travel to the West Bank uh, once or twice a year and stay there for about a month or six weeks um, to work with activists on the ground. Um, through that, I um, gathered a bit of a reputation. Uh, the right wing there was not fond of me. And I had a couple of arrests that had taken place there. They were actually unintentional, but in the West Bank, you can be standing in one area for a moment and the next thing it's declared a closed military zone and you're, you're hauled off. I was once arrested for having a Palestinian flag folded up in my suitcase, um, a variety of, of things. And in 2018, when I tried to enter the country, they um, interrogated me for, seven hours and then deported me back to the US. Um, and as of yet, I am unable to return. They uh, named me a, an extreme, uh, extreme boycott activist. And uh, I wear that with <laughs> as a badge of pride. Um, so anyway, I, I recall one, I, I often recall one of my, one of my friends um, in the West Bank, this incredible activist, Isa Amro. We were talking about, you know, nonviolence and the, the Palestinian um, commitment to it. And there, cause there's a real grassroots uh, commitment there to nonviolent, strategic nonviolence as a form of resistance. And, you know, we were talking about it and um, he said to me, you know, yes, we have legally under international law, we have the right to use violence. But if that's our method, if that's our strategy, assuming that could work, you know, going up against a major military power with, you know, attempting as, <laughs> as a occupied unarmed population to go up against a major military power is you know, absurdity anyway. But he said, assuming you know that could be successful, what society are we left with afterwards? What is our civil society? And so we choose to resist in the way that we want to build uh, our, our civil society. And that uh, rings so true for me in so many ways. Uh, when I hear there's kind of a current debate on um, violence and, and nonviolence in, in political action and um, I'm a pacifist at heart, but that aside, I, I very much believe that our resistance must model the world that we want to create. So in creating that world, I'm gonna move into, and I get really excited because I really love campaigning and uh, I love like getting work out there, uh, what we're embarking on. So um, one of the first things that we're embarking on as FOR will be to um, challenge Christian nationalism 
and white supremacy. And I wanna, you know, kind of give a couple of examples of this and, you know, where we're seeing this today uh, in the election for Pennsylvania, uh, for it was for Pen governor of Pennsylvania, um, candidate Doug Mastriano, who did not win, thankfully, uh, at one of his campaign events, one of the speakers uh, spoke of washing the state, turning the state red by washing it with the blood of Jesus. I mean, just these horrific, um, then we have, you know, Congresswoman Lauren Bobart, who did um, survive her election. It was a tight race, but she is still in Congress, who has said that uh, Jesus would not have, have died on the cross if he had just had an AK-47 at the time and that that was, um, you know, something that was needed. And you will all see in my end of your appeal, I wrote about my, my hometown here, Ithaca, New York and Cayuga Nation. We're, we're a very small town, 10 square miles. Um, very, very liberal, very, very liberal, 10 square miles, two universities, uh, but the minute you leave the town, you see real America. And in the past few years, I mean, it's always been red in that area, um, but in the past few years, Confederate flags have gone up. So when I drive, I, I, my grandmother's 102 and I help take care of her. She lives an hour away from me. And uh, when I drive to see her, I pass houses with Confederate flags. And this is in New York. Um, and this is this is new. Uh, my daughter is uh, studying at the University of Pittsburgh and all throughout Pennsylvania. Anytime you're off the main highways or whatever, when you're in the rural areas, Confederate flags. So um, I think this is a big opportunity here to address this in its roots, because I know we all here on this call know that whatever faith we are a part of, whether it's Judaism or Christianity or Islam or Buddhism, our God, 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 God's self um, wants love and kindness. We all know that God loves all genders and um, all races and religions, and God wants a world um, of of peace and equality, of healthcare and education, of without poverty, that is the, the trueness of God. And yet uh, we have this rise of religion being perverted um, to suggest that, that God's intentions are for hatred and violence. And we see that in Israel with, um, land being claimed in the name of God, land being stolen in the name of God, and we see this here with the rise of Christian nationalism. And we see it across in Europe too. We see it right now in the, in the war in Ukraine. Um, there was a, a, an American who went over to Ukraine to uh, fight for the Ukrainians, and he was nicknamed uh, the Jesus of Ukraine. And he was nicknamed the Jesus of Ukraine. I guess for one reason they said he looked like Jesus, but then they also, because they said he was one of the best fighters, he was killed over there, but he has been memorialized as the Jesus of the Ukraine war for his fighting skills. And, you know, so this is that same question. And uh, I don't know if all of you have seen, but I'm going to give a real pitch for a, initiative that we are running right now to address the war in Ukraine and uh, and uh, we're running it for the Christmas season. So for anybody who didn't know, and I have to say I didn't know until <laughs> last week that in 1914, in the midst of World War I, while uh, Fellowship of Reconciliation was just forming in Europe to support conscientious objectors to that war, um, as Christmas approached, uh, the troops who had been told that, that the war would probably be over by Christmas. But as Christmas was approaching, it was clear that they weren't coming home anytime too soon. Uh, but it was on Christmas Eve in 1914, without any organizing in advance, illegally according to all of the 
countries, militaries that were involved, the men came out of the trenches, the two sides that were fighting and they shared Christmas together. They shared food and their cigarettes. They sang Christmas carols. They uh, played soccer. In fact, there's you know uh, images that were hit the newspaper of, of them playing soccer and somebody brought over a little tree. Unfortunately, the Christmas truce did not last, but it was a beacon of a moment. And I think it's one of those inspiring moments where, you know, we often get told as nonviolent activists, oh, this is so unrealistic, your pacifism, your refusal to fight, your um, peace loving granola selves are never going to, to make an, to have an effect. But we see these moments of creativity that, that appear um, out of nowhere. We also saw it when uh, Ukrainians in the beginning of this war uh, in, Zap in Zaporizhia, in the town of Zaporizhia, put stones and boulders and blocks in front of their road to defend uh, their city nonviolently. And so we have these moments that, that must inspire us, that must inspire us to know that there is another way, that in the words of A.J. Musty, who uh, was a previous um, executive director of Fellowship of Reconciliation, there is no way to peace. Peace is the way. So we are calling for um, another Christmas truce in Ukraine this time. And we are running this initi initiative uh, with Code Pink and with the National Council of Elders, who are, uh, most of them are veterans of the civil rights movement and incredible folks. And, you know, we, we are calling, we're, we're asking faith leaders to sign on. And I wanna ask all of you to, if you are a faith leader, to please add your name and I'm gonna put the, uh, the link in the chat to please add your name. And if you're not a faith leader, you probably have a faith community. So on the first day of us running this campaign, I emailed my rabbi at my local little synagogue and said, you know, would you, and five minutes later, she said, oh my God, I'm so thrilled. So I encourage all of you to go to your faith communities and um, have them sign on to this call for a Christmas truce in the spirit of faith. And with that, I'm gonna open it up for questions and conversation. Thank you, Ariel. As I mentioned before, um, if you have anything you wanna put in the chat or just simply raise your hand or uh, raise your hand electronically. I have a question, Ariel. Yes, uh, please. You mentioned about uh, a program, uh, and a, or, yeah, I guess, a, uh, yeah, a program in a sense, upcoming or in process of uh, working to uh, deal with uh, white nationalism, Christian nationalism. As uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center has done a lot of work in terms of militant, right-wing militancy and that kind of thing. Is, is National FOR going to be uh, uh, kind of interacting or uh, interfacing with them? I very much hope so. We have, um, I have part of a list, do we have part of a list in a document and I have part of it in my head and other members of the team have part of it in our heads of the coalition that we want to build to um, address Christian nationalism. And it's exactly that kind of coalition that we want um, faith leaders, uh, anti-war activists, um, racial justice activists, and those who research the far right and how important uh, that is on all of those levels. Um, and I do try to follow a lot of that from the Southern Poverty Law Center and from other outlets. Um, you know, January 6th uh, was, was a faith initiative before um, the Capitol was invaded the night before the Proud Boys came together to pray and the Oath Keepers are people of that declare themselves to be of faith. So this there, you know, this there the 
racist movement, the white supremacist movement is interlinked with Christian nationalism, with the perverting of faith um, to be a call for, for violence and hatred. So we, as, a, as an interfaith organization, as the oldest interfaith peace and justice organization, this is a moment for us to take leadership. Thank you. I, I don't, <laughs> I'm Mary Margaret Pruitt, and I want to thank you so much. Oh my goodness, you have certainly proven your personal commitment through many, many years from youth to now, and I'm just so deeply grateful for you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I can't wait to see what's going to happen as you work with us. One of the things that you are doing that I appreciate so much is just restating what our foundation is. Uh, there are many, 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 many people who never hear a different narrative other than there's only one way to deal with Putin. There's only one day to deal with. Uh, and there, that isn't true. It isn't true. We have common interests with even those we disagree with most. And I just see your experience and your commitment as, as being a wonderful gift to us. Thank you. I want to say that it's very much mutual and uh, I'm so appreciative of all of you and you, Mary Margaret in particular, and um, all that you have put into FOR uh, and, and the work for peace and justice that is so necessary. And one of my goals really is to get, at, and you're getting kind of a preview of the campaigning, that, of the initiatives that will be launched around the beginning of, of the new year. Um, one of my goals is to bring out FOR's roots and apply them to today as we continue that same work. And so we're looking at um, redefining or broadening, not redefining, broadening the concept of conscientious objection, which was actually coined as a term in, in 1917. Uh, and I imagine that was thanks to FOR in particular. But so, you know, we're also um, calling for support, international FOR and FOR USA for Russian, Ukrainian and Belarusian war resistors, whether they uh, give themselves the late, whether they choose the identity of conscientious objector or they're just fleeing because they don't want to fight, which is such a natural instinct not to want to do, um, that they need to be lifted up and supported as, as the real heroes, right? The heroes in this Ukraine war are not the mercenaries or the, those who can kill better and kill more. It is those who are brave enough to, to recognize that the need for peace and to refuse to fight. But conscientious objection is also larger than that. And you know, here in the US, we no longer have military conscription, but we have a poverty draft. And it fills our military with black and brown people and people of economic disadvantage. And to resist that, to assist the resisting of that, to get uh, recruitment out of our public schools, that is conscientious objection. And conscientious objection is, re is refusing to be a part of white supremacy, refusing to engage in racism and Christian nationalism and misogyny in homophobia and transphobia. And so we are broadening that and calling on all of our communities and, 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 the, and our, our, yeah, our communities of love and faith to conscientiously object um, and instead build beloved community. Thank you. I see uh, Cindy and John have their hand up. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ariel. Um, 
This is big picture. Uh, George Floyd, right wing activists, progressive demonstrations, at least in Washington they intimidate uh, progressives, uh, the police stand by and watch. This is really possible. And then the pandemic and uh, the progressives have taken uh, public health measures seriously, but the right wing goes right out the, into the street and they they're not on it. They first with corporate media. So we, we've stayed on the internet. Uh, how do we go forward in this? Difficult situation. I think I, I it was a little difficult to hear. There was some breaking up, but I think I caught the gist. I heard uh, you talk about the right wing in the streets, and many of us um, are in our homes and <laughs> trying new ways of organizing. One of the things that I see as as I watch uh, people who really monitor the far right, and I have a, a journalist friend who goes to all of the. Proud Boy rallies uh, down to Florida when they're gathering there to the, um, you know, right in the thick of it to document it. Um, one of the things that, that appears to me is that the, that the far right, the extremists in many ways are utilizing um, the tools that we activists built for many decades, right? Um, they're utilizing some of the language as well in, in their forms of resistance. And I want to invite all of us in that, in that case to get creative, right? Because just simply um, continuing on in the same ways that we've done things may not work in that circumstance. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, for a long time, there were a lot of mass, mass arrests in uh, Washington, DC, thousands of people. Um, but it, it was simply, you know, you would all get gathered into, and I did many of them, and you get gathered into a roped off area by the police, and then you pay your $50 and they let you out. Well, that's not what civil resistance um, in the tradition of like Martin Luther King was. Uh, so we have to really think about what is it to creatively resist? What is it to confront hatred, to shine a mirror on that hatred such that um, our civil resistance is resistance. It is not in any way passivity, but it is provocative. And as we see the extremist, you know, now using some of these, some of this language and some of these terms, we don't want to counter back in the same way and get caught into um, their web of violence, which they would, you know, love to catch us <laughs> into, but to reflect back uh, with love and with creativity. And at this moment, that's um, for us in calling for a, a Christmas truce. And then um, going forward from there, part of the initiatives on, on Christian nationalism uh, will involve work to define it and to help people really understand uh, what it is and to declare themselves um, to conscientiously object to it. So I invite all of us to, myself included, to uh, get creative. And we, we definitely have the, we have the dedication and um, that dedication. And you know, I, I wanna bring this back to as well. Uh, I was talking with June Wink the other day, who was a, um, it, there's a, we have a fellowship, the, Walter Wink and June Keener Wink Fellowship. Uh, Walter was a theologian and um, longtime FOR member. And I was talking with her and, and the question got posed, like, how do you not, she said to me, how do you not get discouraged? How do you not give up? And we were talking about the right as it's rising, the extremists as they're rising and co-opting um, the tactics that we have long used and, um, and I said to her, I, I told her two stories. Uh, the one you might've seen in an email I sent out, the uh, cracks in the sidewalk that I, I, I always notice in the spring and summer, um, you know, I'll be walking along some city street and I see these beautiful flowers just coming up amid the concrete where I can't I couldn't imagine that anything could grow. And yet the earth continues, just continues. 
Um, and then the other is from my experiences in, in Palestine. And uh, one, on one of my fairly early trips there, I said to a veteran activist, I said, you know, how do you not give up? Like, how do you not get discouraged? Because, you know, here you all are in your popular committees and you're doing uh, weekly nonviolent marches and you're doing creative this and you, you know, you're protesting that way and yet more settlements are just going up and things are getting worse and they're getting worse and they're worse and worse and worse. And she said to me, we don't have that privilege to give up, that privilege that that, that might be something that you have the privilege of, of pessimism, <laughs> you know, in, in your life back in, in the U.S. where you are not living under a military occupation and system of apartheid. But when you are, you don't have that option. And that, that's one of those things that has um, really stuck with me, that we don't have that option. And we have to uh, remain optimistic towards our goals even in the face of, um, of, of dark and dangerous times. Bruce has his hand up. Bruce? Yeah, sorry about that, David. I was uh, trying to get my mouse to get to the, my, uh, my microphone to unmute. Ariel, thank you so much for sharing your, your time and your wisdom and your grace with us. My question is a follow-up on, on kind of what you were talking about here and on John and Cindy's question uh, about the rise of the right wing. Um, I see the rise of the right wing uh, across the globe being interrelated with the greater immigration pandemic, I guess I would say, because people are having to flee more places that are unstable and more places that are unlivable. And as climate change gets worse, that pattern is going to accelerate. And historically, we've had many, many anti-immigration movements in response to immigrants having to relocate from one place to another. It just seems to be part of the part and parcel of, of the human uh, DNA to be scared of the other uh, and, and that that resistance is there. So I see that being related. And my question is, FOR has historically, and I think wisely and prophetically, been opposed to war. And then when we had the advent of nuclear weapons, being almost singularly opposed to we should not be going down this path. Nuclear weapons, just, you know, it's uh, our choices, coexistence or annihilation. And now we have not only the threat of nuclear weapons, but the survival threat from climate change, which is an incremental boiling the frog in the water that gets warmer and warmer until it's too late. How do you see the FOR linking those issues of survival issues of anti-militarism and nuclear and the now threat of climate change, soil erosion, uh, degradation of the environment to the point where we're you know, having greater and greater numbers of people with disease and disability because of the pollution you know, on our planet? What role do you see for the FOR in this moment of uh, existential threat and the penumbra of issues that are raised by that specter? Well, first, I, I just want to say, make no mistake about it, this um, pandemic of immigration is man-made and man-made by uh, Western powers and very specifically the Middle East. Um, very much the colonization of the Middle East initially by European powers and then of course U.S. intervention in the Middle East that has in the immediacy caused the uh, crisis of immigration that is you know that we see on the European continent, the, the wave of immigration that's a direct result of U.S. interference in the Middle East, the Iraq war and its fallout. 
And the same is true with Latin America, right? It's no coincidence that people are fleeing um, those countries because they're not safe because we spent many years interfering in Latin America and creating significant problems. So, you know, we are the cause of, of, of this. And, you know, I wanna say also that these issues, right? From climate change to militarism, to immigration, to nuclear annihilation, these are all linked. Um, you know, let's not forget for a moment that the US military is the largest industrial polluter in the world. Uh, I don't have the numbers on me of uh, the amount of crude oil, or, you know, that's turned into gas that's needed to power one F-35, which is our main jet these days. But- Oh, anyway, I'm sorry, we just have about 30 seconds to go. Okay, I'll be very quick. It is astounding. And so what, what I want to say, was, and I was talking to somebody else about this, about there's so many things to work on, that any one thing we work on, whether it's Christian nationalism here, or Christmas truce in Ukraine, or calling for nuclear disarmament, which is how I think we should respond to Putin's escalation, I think we should pull missiles out. Um, all the missiles closest to the Russian border, we could just start with those and pull out all the nuclear weapons and, and disarm. But uh, whatever it is that we're working on, it affects all of the other issues. And so um, as long as we're doing good work, we're contributing. And as long and it, within that, that you know, we want to work strategically. So we want to pick something that we can work on and know that it affects all the other uh, pieces that all of all of uh, just like militarism and nuclear annihilation and immigration are connected, so too are our struggles for peace and justice. And with that, I will thank you all. And it was just wonderful to get to meet you all and so much love and appreciation. I would stay for the rest of your meeting, but I'm going to get off and go back to uh, Shabbat rest. Um, Ariel, thank you. I um, want to draw your attention to the question we didn't get from the chat from the Rachel Corey Foundation. Oh, um, that my Cindy you're Corey, a friend. Is Cindy, is Cindy on? Cindy's on, yeah. Oh, Cindy. Yeah. She it has a question. But I think the main thing I wanted to do was to acknowledge that she was on and wanted to hear you. And she said, Thank you for being here. It's good to see you. Can you talk about the oppor opportunities to impact U.S. policy and funding of Israel militarism, given the move to the extreme extreme right in the recent Israeli elections? And what can we do about this? And that we need to end and go to our next speaker. Yeah, maybe I'll you just can. Say that I'm going to put my that. email in the chat, Cindy. I'm trying to remember the first time I met you, but it was, I was just so excited and remain and just thank you, Cindy, for all of your work. I'm going to put my email in the chat. Um, I'd love to be in touch with any of you, but Cindy in particular, uh, if you want to reach out to me, I would love to talk about ideas and collaboration and all of that stuff. Thank you.